Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Samara Osmond, and on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada, I'm very happy to welcome you to day two of our virtual conference. And today's theme has been sexual health and neuromuscular disorders. We had two excellent webinars. And um, so if you had joined those webinars previously, welcome back. Uh, the first one was on pregnancy and neuromuscular disorders. And then we just got off a webinar on family planning and genetics. Before I continue, I should say that today's session is available in English and in French. There is a globe icon on your screen for which you can go ahead and select English or French. Um, and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Marie Helen Bulduk. She is one of our directors of mission who will be able to share this instruction in French as well. Oui, alors bonjour tout le monde et merci beaucoup d'être là pour cette troisième euh, conférence de la journée sur la santé sexuelle et les maladies neuromusculaires. Alors, la première euh, présentation était sur la grossesse, la deuxième sur le conseil génétique et celle-ci sur la sexualité. Alors, si vous voulez entendre la conférence euh, en français, il s'agit de suivre comme sur l'image, euh, d'aller cliquer sur le globe terrestre et euh, de choisir la langue de votre choix, soit français ou anglais, et peu importe la langue langue de, de transmission, vous, ce, ce que vous allez entendre, c'est la langue que vous aurez choisie. Alors, merci beaucoup et bonne conférence. Thank you very much, Marie Helen. So I was uh, just mentioning to our speakers before everyone joined that this has been one of the most popular topics and sessions that um, our participants for the conference have registered for. It is one that a lot of individuals feel like they want to get more information on and gain confidence of how do you talk to your physician about sex and sexuality and how does that even relate to neuromuscular disorders. So we are super grateful that we have two experts in this field that can help to speak to this topic. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Gagnon, she is a researcher and clinician at the Sherbrooke University in Canada. Professor Gagnon trained as an occupational therapist and obtained her PhD in rehabilitation from Laval University. She is a leading um, uh, researcher in the interdisciplinary research program to document the natural history of the most prevalent neuromuscular disorders in Canada, including myotonic, dystrophy, and RSACs. Um, Dr. Gagnon is also a member of the Neuromuscular Disease Network for Canada and a great supporter of MDC. We love working with her. We're also really grateful to have Samar Muslameni. She is a trainee at Sherbrooke University working with Dr. Gagnon. She is an occupational therapist and pursuing a master's degree in independent living and researching patients with childhood onset DM1 myotonic dystrophy type 1. She just finished her data collection and um, has also worked on guidelines, which she has spoke uh, to some of you about in the past at one of our uh, French webinars, uh, guidelines around um, sexuality and, and occupational therapists. I'm sure she'll be speaking more about that today. Welcome to both of you and thank you again for accepting our request to participate in today's webinar. I'll go ahead and stop sharing so you can share your slides. Hi, okay, so now you're seeing my screen, but you're, if I put a full screen, do you see, uh, it's okay? Okay, yeah. good. Right. So, so first of all, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Omira and all the team from Muscular Dystrophy Canada. Both Cynthia and I are really, really happy to be uh, here with you today and to all people uh, watching, thank you. So today we're gonna present to you uh, an important project that. I've been working on uh, under the supervision of Cynthia since 2016, which uh, during my uh, occupational therapy uh, training. So uh, with Cynthia and my teammates, we created a practice guideline to help uh, occupational therapists who, wishes to, who wish to address uh, sexuality with their patients living with neuromuscular diseases. So uh, the goal of the presentation today is, of course, to talk to you about this practical guideline, but more concretely, to talk to you about what is sexuality, because uh, it is not a simple concept. Talk to you about uh, how impairments in neuromuscular diseases, uh, think how can they impact uh, sexuality? Uh, 
uh, how can I open the subject the subject with my healthcare provider? Because as we uh, know, it is not an easy thing to do. And finally, of course, we're gonna talk to you about how your healthcare professionals can help you in activities related to sexuality. And of course, a little accent uh, will be put on occupational therapy as we are both uh, occupational therapists. So that's it. If you have any questions, do not hesitate uh, during. I will try to watch them. I, I, I think it's got the end, so let's let, let that go. Uh, what is sexuality, first of all? Um, what I want to say is that sexuality, of course, it's the physical act, but it, it includes a lot, uh, numerous uh, concepts such as affection, love's life, uh, self-esteem, reproduction, social relationships. So sexuality is a complete, uh, com complex, I'm sorry, activity. But uh, of course today uh, we'll put an accent on uh, the physical act. Uh, as you'll see, we'll talk about other areas, but mostly the physical act, which uh, considers uh, making love, caress, masturbation, uh, kissing, hugging, touching. So. Uh, that's for what we are going to address today. Um, how can impairments in NMD influence sexuality? So as you know, there's many, many, many neuromuscular diseases, and we could not talk about all of them today. But what I try to do is uh, go by each uh, system. So uh, we're going to talk about some symptoms in uh, different systems. And some of you may have neither, no, no, uh, not any of these symptoms, some of you may all may have all of them, some of you one or two. So, so just, just, uh, it's just to give you an idea about uh, the impairments. First of all, but not, uh, an important system is the muscular system, as you know, in neuromuscular diseases, the decrease in muscle strength is an important aspect. It can cause a difficulty or complete inability to assume certain positions to uh, for the sexual act, it can lead to a decreased endurance because, as you know, uh, sexual uh, the sexual act is a physically demanding activity for everyone. So, even more for people who have problems with fatigue or muscle strength, the decreased ability to close your hand, uh, prehension, or people who have myotonia, like in myotonic dystrophy, which is a difficulty to uh, relax after a contraction that can lead to problems in masturbation, holding your sex toy, for example. I'm sorry, pain uh, can cause, of course, as the muscle strength, it can cause a difficulty to assume certain positions. The fear, of course, of having pain during the process, some people can avoid sexual activities because of it. And spasticity is also an important symptom. Regarding central nervous system, as we know, fatigue, hypersomnolence in some of the neuromuscular diseases can cause a decreased interest or dec uh, decreased endurance and less opportunities uh, to have sex. And I'd like to point out that does that this do not mean that this, that sexuality is not important to the person. It only means that they have more trouble initiating or doing the act activity. So that's an important distinction. Distinction. I'm sorry, <laughs> English is not my first language. And of course, uh, there's a uh, general co cognitive functioning, such as uh, some people may have memory loss or attention problems, which can lead to uh, risky behaviors, such as uh, forgetting your contra contraception or condom. Um, digestive system is an important one that we do not talk as much, but should be talked about more. Uh, urinary or fecal incontinence can lead to a, a fear of accidents uh, during sexual relations, stomach pain, a difficulty to enjoy difficult uh, activities related to sexuality as any pain is. And dysphagia can lead most, mostly to uh, difficulties in um, dating, for example, going to restaurants. Some people who have dys dysphagia uh, are embarrassed of eating in public, so they avoid restaurants, they avoid, they avoid dates, and that has an important as uh, impact. Cardiac and respiratory system. Uh, some patients have told us that they have, because of their cardiac problems, they have a, a fear of doing sexual activities. They do not know if their heart is going to handle it, for example, 
or people with uh, respiratory problems may need a ventilation system like CPAP or um, BPAP during the night. And that may uh, lead to the fact that partners do not sleep in the same bedroom and that can make less opportunities to have sex or in intimate uh, acts. So uh, that's something that we should uh, take into account. And of course, gynecological system, for example, uh, we know that men with myotonic dystrophy, uh, uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but there's, it has been demonstrated that people, men with uh, myotonic dystrophy can have erectile dysfunction. Menstrual pain, as you know, can affect sexuality too. So uh, as occupational therapists, healthcare providers, we, uh, and as, of course, as specialists in NMDs, we know how to consider all of these difficulties, abilities, and to uh, understand how we can find you solutions to uh, help you with your activity of sexuality, because we take these symptoms into account. Now, how can I talk to sex about sexuality with my healthcare provider? That usually leads to one important, another important question, but why do I have to do it? And it's a rightful question because uh, study have shown, studies have shown that uh, patients usually prefer that it's the healthcare provider that addresses sexuality first. But as you know, for many reasons, uh, this is not what we do yet. Um, sexuality is still, I don't know if it, we can say that in, uh, in English, but taboo. So it means that it's still a subject that is not uh, addressed spontaneously for many reasons, such as being uncomfortable, uh, knowing that, for example, I am an occupational therapist and at my establishment, I don't know if, if no one talks about sexuality ever with their patients, why should I do it? That's sometimes a question that uh, some healthcare providers may have. The lack of training. I remember uh, when I was an occupational therapy student, I did not have one course uh, about sexuality. Of course, uh, for the exception of Cynthia, who gave us <laughs> a presentation, but other than that, no training whatsoever about sexuality. So this can lead to like a fear of opening a Pandora's box, which means that I take the courage and I finally address sexuality with my patient and then my patient is happy and starts talking to me about all his issues and I have nothing to offer him back because I don't have the resources to address it. So that can be a reason why uh, healthcare providers do not address it. Or uh, during my training, I, do, I did not have any supervisor who addressed it in front of me, so I never knew how to address it and the absence of a sexologist in the healthcare team may be an important uh, obstacle because as you know, they are really uh, good at intervention in sexuality. But, so these are our examples of um, why it's not uh, often brought up. So what we have decided, why we think and until the point where sexuality is more addressed as fun, like at first hand for from all healthcare providers, we're, we're not there yet, but until then, we suggest that uh, sexuality should be a, talking about it should be a dual responsibility. So today we're gonna try to show you some tips about how to address it so that it's easier for you and easier for the healthcare providers. And before that, I wanna show you uh, what we use among healthcare professionals, uh, because as you know, and we, we, we'd like that more healthcare professional address it first. So this is the explicit model, uh, which is a model that is addressed to any healthcare provider, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, anyone who wishes to address sexuality with their patient. So there's different concepts, but the important one here, the most important is the one on the center. So the P for permission. You have to offer the permission permission to your patient that is it is okay to talk about sexuality and you are open to it so i'm sorry uh, we there's indirect and direct strategies indirect strategies would be uh, like to hang up a poster that says okay did you know that occupational therapists can help you with work with cooking meals 
with sexuality, just put it out there with the other activities so that, oh, someone who reads that knows that ooh, it's something I can address. The more direct way would be with the example on your screen. That's only an example. If I have a patient with multiple sclerosis, I could say a general sentence like several women uh, living with multiple sclerosis have concerns regarding this, uh, their intimacy. Is it something you have thought about? Would you like to talk about it more? So that way it opens up the door. The patient can choose if he is comfortable to yes, talk about it, or if he's not comfortable, just say no. And then we go to another subject and it's no problem. And even that the, the patient can still think about it when he gets home and maybe if some a problem, an issue comes up, he can, he can think to himself, oh, I know that my, my healthcare provider has already talked to me about this, so I can address the subject with him. So that's uh, uh, what we use, what we present to occupational uh, healthcare providers. But for patients, how to approach your healthcare team? Uh, first of all, I, uh, the important here, the important thing here, I want everyone to remember is the, um, is that you should feel comfortable to address sexuality, and it, even if you decide to talk about, if you decide to talk about sexuality with your healthcare provider, it is okay. Some areas you might want to talk about and some areas you might not want to talk about and it is, it is perfectly okay. So make a list in your head about your concerns. What do you not want to talk about? What is to, uh, after your limit and that's okay. So make a list of your concerns. Choose a person in your healthcare team that you feel at ease to talk to. Some, someone maybe you have, you, you have known for a long time, someone you have felt a great connection with, so find that person and make an appointment with him or her if possible or address it during your annual visit. Um, avoid the doorknob approach. As you know, sexuality is an important thing and we, th we think you shouldn't, it shouldn't be like a last minute, oh, I just remembered thing that you wanna address to your, uh, at the office of your healthcare provider when once you hold the knob and you're all, almost ready to go that should it, it should be like sitting down talking about it to show how serious you are about this and of course make up a follow a visit a visit uh, to see if you, what you have found as solution did it, did it work did it not and things like that so these are the four steps i would recommend okay. that's it now uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how how different healthcare providers can help you uh, in sexuality. But we're going to first begin with occupational therapy. As you know, occupational therapy uh, we are specialists in analyzing activities. So, for example, cooking, working, uh, dressing up. We see the person, his and her abilities, difficulties. We see the occupation, which is the task the steps to do the task, the preparation, and the environment, like barriers or, or if you have a partner or not, or um, help, how do you say that? Someone who helps you, <laughs> it's okay. So we consider all three, these three concepts and we help and we put them all together and we find solutions with you. Uh, for example, organizing a daily routine, uh, managing personal hygiene before and during sexual activities, compensating for reduction or loss of function, uh, alter or eliminate uh, env environmental <laughs> barriers to improve the quality of your sexual activities. And we adapt sexual devices to, to meet the abilities of clients. And uh, you're gonna see in the next few slides uh, examples pictures of uh, sexual objects or sexual toys that are uh, available out there but uh, I wanted really to talk to you that it's only uh, these these pictures are only to show you example what exists but we see uh, you should never buy that like because we, you shouldn't buy that just because you saw it in this presentation, you should talk about it with your, one of your healthcare provider or your partner and think about it. These are just examples. Uh, first of all, positioning. 
it is an important part of sexual uh, activities, as you know. Uh, some technical aids that you already have, such as a bell helper or hand grab rails, could help uh, someone with their positioning to change position during sexual activities. And this is something you can discuss with your OT, occupational therapy therapist. Teaching new way to mobilize in bed. Anchoring the equipment to a bath chair for an easier use in the shower. Uh, that can also help with the cleaning after, which is uh, easier if you're in the shower already. And uh, using an electrical bed. Some of you may already have one. May, some of you may consider getting one because of other pro problems you may have. But think that uh, we should think that um, an electrical bed can help you uh, for sexuality too. For example, raising the e head end of the bed can allow the person to sit, which makes it easier for visual contact caressing. Or you can just lower the bed to the maximum so that the partner can be, your partner uh, can be outside the bed and that can allow other types of positions. So we have a, an electrical bed can be really, really useful. And if you already have one, just we can you can try it but of course we uh, you have to consider that most uh, electrical beds are for one person only so that's kind of a compromise uh, you have to think about and i i did not talk about it yet but intimate rider and rider weights are both equipments uh, that are mostly used with um spinal cord injury but can uh, because the chair you can't see it maybe but it does the back and forth movement for you. So it, it's, um, it saves you energy. So that's one kind of uh, equipment that exists out there. Regarding pain management, uh, as occupational therapists, we are used to giving you uh, tips about how to manage your pain, such uh, as training to recognize your symptoms of pain, uh, range of motion, avoiding repeated repetitive movements. We can also uh, teach you the therapeutic properties of the sexual activity. And some tips about positioning. For example, if you're on top, you know what I mean, and you're sitting like uh, with your wrist uh, like that, this can be stressful for your wrist. So we could suggest, uh, as you see on the picture on the right, instead of being like that, you could just put uh, make a fist with your hand and then it's your wrist in the neutral position so it's not as painful as the first position I showed you. So that's an example of something you could do and we can uh, offer you different tips like that for if you have neck pain, uh, limit, limited hip uh, range of motion, elbows with pillows and um, using the the electrical bed or different positions. So that's uh, another type of uh, intervention solution we can find with you. And of course, energy conservation techniques, such as choosing the right moment for sexual relations. Uh, you know yourself if you have more energy in the morning or uh, after the your lunch, or, or not usually after lunch, but maybe later in the day, <laughs> you have more energy. That, so that's when you should uh, decide to have sexual relations. Taking breaks before and after, plan these breaks because they are important and will make your sexual activity more enjoyable. Uh, using a less demanding, more passive position, such as spooning, which is uh, easier. Using pillows, more specialized positioning cushions, such as the one uh, that is uh, showed in this slide. Or exploring alternatives of penetration, such as oral sex or caress which can be less demanding. Now, uh, regarding masturbation, uh, there's lots of uh, every day, there's like new sexual objects, more easy ones, more harder to use ones. But as because, as, because there are so many, there's uh, lots of options. Uh, one thing I like to talk about, which is not a sexual object, but the universal cuff, I think as an occupational therapist is, I usually recommend for people to hold their razor or their toothbrush. So we thought, why not use it to hold your, to help you hold your uh, masturbator vibrator. So that's what something you could do if you already have one, or you could 
try to procure one for yourself. Uh, as occupational therapists, we our rule is to make uh, sexual objects easier to use. For example, adding switches or bigger buttons. As you see, the doxy one on the right has bigger buttons, with, so it would be easier to use for someone who has dexterity problems, for example. Some uh, sexual toys have uh, remote controls that could be used by your phone or another distant remote, so it can be used by your partner, for example. And stationary devices such as the cushions with the, as you see here. So lots of options. <laughs> And that's it for my part. I hope I didn't take too long. So here you go, Sinta. <laughs> oh. You have to stop sharing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's see if I'm as good as Samar for sharing screen. I think it is. Do you see my screen? And I'm just That's gonna, great. yeah, and I'm just gonna put that, okay. Uh, okay, so, oops, okay, so um, thank you. So there's really a lot of options that Samar has uh, shown you and there's only an uh, example. Um, but we have all, we wanted also to talk about other professionals from the healthcare team that can uh, help you. Um, so, um, because we really think that it's a multidisciplinary approach uh, if we want to make it the most useful. Uh, although you don't need to talk to all of those therapists, but we can work together. So physical therapists will educate and assist client with uh, transferring from wheelchair to bed, repositioning in bed, maintaining balance, uh, maximizing comfort also because they're also, uh, they receive a lot of training on pain. Um, and one thing that is very uh, important and I wanted to point out is a, not a new um, uh, practice field, but something that is not as known, which is called perineal re-education. So it's an advanced practice um, that some physical therapists do. And I have the chance to work with a very good one. We're trying, uh, we're putting up a, 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 um, prelim a pilot project uh, where it's really about working with patients to either treat pain during relationships. So some of your neuromuscular disease can bring on pain for different reasons and the perineural reeducation can help that. And it can also improve incontinence issue which could interfere with uh, sexual activities. Nurse of course uh, can be of great help they can assist with the execution of many of the suggestions given by the OT, the PT, or the, the medical practitioner. Uh, and they will be uh, at the clinic. We have a nurse case manager, so she knows, uh, she knows well all of our patients. So she can take into account the environment of the patient or their actual relationship. Uh, there is also sexual health clinician that are nurse that specialize in the area of sexual health. They are expert in educating client and their partner on the complex change to sexual function. Because as we did not address it, but the neuromuscular disease are progressive. So sometimes with time, it will uh, change and your ability or your physical capacity or your fatigue will increase or decrease so they can help. They can also think about the medication that can help also. Uh, social worker and psychologists Social worker can play a large role in educating and counseling partners and family around sexual and fertility issues. And they also can assist with the funding option for the purchase of those equipment, because obviously they don't come uh, for free. And the cycle, and we said that sexuality is a very broad concept. So there is issue also with, um, we've seen that with our patients that as their ability decrease, uh, they have trouble to adapt to that new role that they have. I had numerous patients came to me after my talk saying, well, I used to do this and this and be uh, on top or do this position and this make me feel like a man and now I'm not able to assume that position. So there's something also psychological in the adaptation regarding sexuality and psychologists or social worker can help with that and to, uh, Re reanalyze that uh, those beliefs and those value that you have so that you can still have 
uh, a, a positive sexuality. Uh, one thing that I wanted also to address, because I think, I mean, I mean, there might be also some parents in the audience, is that it's not only your own sexuality, but it's also talking to your children about sexuality, so believe it or not, uh, although I give many conferences per year about sexuality, uh, I still had trouble the first time I had to address sexuality with my own teenager. You know, I had to practice. I was like, my heartbeat was going up and I was feeling on at ease, you know? So it's not because you're talking about it that you feel confident about it. So if you have a child that has a neuromuscular disorder and is, you know, reaching toward its teenage year or is an adult, there is other issue. So I'm just giving a little... Uh, end of what could be coming, but that's another subject, but it's a very important one because many parents are nervous about approaching the subject of sexuality, but there's an added layer of complexity when your children has physical capacity or cognitive issue that may hinder his ability to have a positive, uh, you know, sexuality. Um, but one thing that you have to remember is for most of those teenagers, uh, sexuality is a key concept, even if they have physical disability. I used to work in um, a, a, a summer camp with uh, children with neuromuscular disorder, and I was usually with uh, boys. And I mean, they were talking a lot about sex. It's not because they were not able to move a finger that they didn't have, you know, uh, wanting to have a girlfriend, wanted to kiss, wanted to explore. So those things do uh, happen but it's just harder to, uh, you know, um, approach it oftentimes. Um, so the hormonal development that comes with puberty happens to all adolescents, and they will inevitably lead to an exploration of their own body and the accompanying sensation, including masturbation. But that can be more complicated for those children because either they have physical disability or they have cognitive issues. The other part that is important, and it's not part of this talk, but we need to think about it, it's the self-image. It's very important uh, in the teenage year, probably even more today with those Instagram and all of this, uh, there's a pressure from media and society. Uh, so there is a lot of positive mo movement toward diversity uh, of body, of image, of uh, you know gender, et cetera. So I think it's a very positive uh, move forward. Uh, but we need to address it also with uh, children with neuromuscular disease. And there could be discussion around this topic with psychologists, social worker, also to help the teenager to uh, address those important issues. And there is uh, some um, special resources. Uh, in terms of romantic relationship, there's also an important uh, point because uh, you may fear as a parent, and I think we all fear it to one point or another, that our teen will be rejected or hurt by the person to whom she or he is attracted. And that happened to all teenagers uh, that they, you know, they get a, um, a pen d'amour. So, uh, and it's really important to start a discussion with uh, both parents to discuss about your own, um, your own fear how does the impact on how you talk to your children? And it's maybe good also to discuss it with your next case practitioner, with your uh, the social worker or the doctor, just to think about, okay, is that the good message that I'm conveying to my children? Is that the one that I should convey to my children? So um, we have to, uh, we really need to address this uh, in a more, I think, thoughtful way uh, to make sure we, we send the right message. Uh, in terms of sexual relationship, there, there's often a, a thing with all parents, I think, of teenagers that it does not exist until it does. Um, so this is, I like this sentence, which is dignity of taking risk and discussing it, you know. Uh, so if you are comfortable discussing this very intimate subject with your teen, uh, you should know that there are, again, the resources that some are shown. There is also options for your kids uh, to be able to do self-exploration or to give them the possibility to address some of their issue regarding sexuality. Um, now, if you're not really uh, that uh, at ease, then uh, there is some trick that we wanted to do you. So it's really to pick up some um, key message that your children is sending to you, 
do not wait too long before addressing the subject. It's just gonna make it worse for both of you. Uh, there's also uh, sometimes discussion that can be uh, done after seeing a movie or a commercial on a particular aspect of sexuality. And I'm saying that, and I don't, I don't think it's easy to do because I had my kids sometimes say, okay, mom, please don't, stop it, stop it. But sometimes it's not, it's maybe not you the best person, but it's maybe to offer to your kids uh, a way to talk to one of their healthcare provider that they feel at ease, someone that they've known for a long time, someone that they trust or at, this, at their school. Um, and the idea is that um, it's an, there's an additional issue when there is mild or severe intellectual disability. But what I wanted you to know is that there is resources for that. There has been a lot of research, a lot of clinical practice and there is things that are available. So don't uh, think that there is nothing out there. I think there's a lot, but you just, uh, you need to get um, talking about it and then people will provide you with resources. As Samar said, we're all a little bit shy to talk about it. Uh, so uh, I think you, you need also to empower yourself as parent to be able to discuss it with your clinical team as you discuss work, leisure, uh, school, or you know autonomy. Um, be aware of your own limitations, of course, and if you're uncomfortable, then you can uh, either take a resources from the school or the healthcare professional. Internet dating, couldn't do a presentation without that. That's a major issue for all uh, parents of teenagers. Uh, we know from several research that people with a uh, teenager with physical disability are more at risk to get into a bad uh, situation. So there is some trick like do not share any personal information, do not send explicit photograph or undress to someone online. Or, uh, and if there is a, uh, and discuss it with your children about if they're doing it uh, and maybe not, you know, and discussing it more openly, you will be, uh, you will know before, you know, it goes to a, a you know, a, a bad point. And some, a lot of people that I know as patient has been online dating and they have, uh, they have a good relationship with the person online and it came to a real couple. But the thing is that, you know, you have to be more cautious with your uh, teenager. Uh, sexual assault and abuse, that is something that may happen and people with physical or intellectual disability are more vulnerable to sexual abuse. So this is where it is also important to address it because they may look for people that will be willing to talk to them about it, but they may not be the good person uh, to talk about it or to experience it. So there is, uh, and there is education to provide to your kids about inappropriate touching or sexual solicitations and uh, empowering your child to be assertive and speak out will uh, protect them better by, by all means of inappropriate intimate contact. Uh, we have also uh, other resources, uh, so they will be available online. And the good news that we have is that the uh, uh, clinical guideline for occupational therapy will be available soon in English as we just received a funding uh, from Heritage Canada in collaboration with Muscular Dystrophy Canada to make it uh, in English. So this will be also uh, available soon. Uh, there is also other uh, resources that are available. The Pleasurable is a really nice one that we really like. And the Come As You Are is a uh, site that address team related to sexuality and include a section for the, the person that are physically disabled. So that is very interesting as well. And it's very inclusive as a uh, resources. So that's very uh, interesting. So I think that that is excellent. Thank you so much, Samar and Cynthia. I can't tell you how many uh, private messages I have received with <laughs> individuals saying this is the first time they have heard from healthcare professionals talk so openly about sex and sexuality. And for the first time, they feel like this um, concept has been acknowledged. And they really want to thank you for, for sharing the information and the resources. We also received some questions. And I know we have some questions in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll go ahead and start with one question. 
one of our clients is mentioning that they are undergoing a transition in gender. Um, and so they are wondering if there are any resources about individuals who um, have physical disabilities and are also going through the transitioning process. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there is, uh, this, the, the, there is not, I would say, specific uh, resources. Uh, although the, I think the sit, the sit come as you are is, uh, is one that may have some resources. Uh, you can also try, um, and we, for the Q&A, some we have answered, some we probably don't, but if Amira does a list of them, we can answer it on a chat or make it somewhere available. Uh, we try to be inclusive in our guideline in occupational therapists uh, about even, uh, we, we try to find a way to, I think we, we call it, I mean, it's in French, but it's, uh, um, um, exp I, so okay, creative, creative sexual practice. So we try to focus also on other uh, sexual practice that are less, I would say in quote, less common. Uh, so, but we didn't address uh, uh, gender, um, uh, gender specifically, but I will try to find out. You have anything, Samara? I know that on social media, you can find uh, lots of uh, people who address it as their own experience, but I don't know if there's um, a specific not, like study or documentation like reliable, but I know more and more people because of the opening of social media talk about their experiences. So that can be something uh, maybe make contact or learn about others experience. So that may be an option, but up until now, to my knowledge, there's no uh, Specific, specific documentation or program or resource. Very good, thank you. Um, another question that came up, and I know Dr. Genyan, you addressed this, but um, how to sort of manage the rejection of if you have a physical disability because of a neuromuscular disorder, how do you deal with the pain of uh, being rejected? You talked about um, uh, a psychologist and psychotherapist being important members of a team. Uh, could you expand on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that the, the idea, so that's not the field of occupational therapy. I mean, although we will uh, help in uh, providing a positive self-image and self-esteem, that's something that we, 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 do as a, we do have as a value, but we don't address it particularly. But the thing is that I think that the psychologist will be able to provide you with a, um, another way of thinking or you know, viewing your situation in a different light. And probably the social worker could be also a good asset because they know a lot of resources uh, in terms of, uh, well, I know one of the social worker that has, uh, you know, specialized site for dating, uh, because it's also giving you some chance, you know, in terms of dating and maybe trying with something less challenging or closer to your, uh, I would say, interest. So if you, I would just give an example and that's just on top of my head, but if you go to a dating site that is based on a sport performance, well, you will be probably less able to connect with people than if you go, and there's a lot now of uh, at least online dating site for spe very specific uh, um, uh, kind of interests or hobby. So there is one for art, People are like art, music, and all of this. There is one for sport. There is other for, I mean, there's also one night stand uh, type of, uh, you know. So I think that with your uh, probably social worker, there could be options uh, to, um, to, to look at that. So I think the social uh, uh, worker would be also a good asset to find ways uh, to deal with that. I don't know if that helps. Oh yeah, yeah Samal? I'd like to add something. I know uh, that in Quebec, we have a group program called the uh, uh, Rencontre Adapté, which is www.rencontreadapté.com, which are, uh, it's like a dating, uh, not a side, but it's a opportunity to meet people who want to date, with or be friends with people, other people who have disabilities. So I know that they, they not in the pandemic, but they usually do act, group activities and it's an opportunity to meet other people with disability. So I know that exists in Quebec. I would not know though for all, uh, the rest of Canada, but if we have it in Quebec, maybe there, uh, there should be uh, in Canada, we should just uh, look for it. Maybe we'll do that for our next presentation. 
That'd be fantastic. And, and the thing is that it's, it's really to balance between if you feel more comfortable dating other person with disability or just going into the open, but then select, you know, uh, I say dating sites that are more linked to specific interests that you might share with other people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's the, the message. And the, uh, the, I think the therapist will just help to ease the pain uh, surrounding uh, this, for sure. Um, in addition to the most popular comment, which is thank you again for acknowledging this issue and in discussing it, the other most popular question that's been coming in is, how do you access these these aids? Uh, Samar, you spoke about some examples of, of different um, aids that can help uh, for um, supporting a good sexual experience. and. I would assume you would go to your occupational therapist uh, to help, um, but then they're also asking about funding. So how about you go ahead and, and start with the, the technical aids, how to access those? Um, uh, I can start. Uh, yeah. For choosing, as I said, for choosing the technical aid, I, I think that an occupational therapist uh, can and has an important role in this too because we know the abilities we can anticipate that maybe this one if you have some ideas you can present it to your occupational therapist because we can anticipate although you have difficulty with your dexterity maybe not choose this one so we can help make it easier to choose a uh, technical aid because uh, it is expensive uh, in the resources at the end of the presentation like in come as you are or pleasure able there's examples of um, uh, sexual objects that are where you can buy them. And uh, I think the, the one I showed uh, was who was named Hot Octopus. If you tap that on Google, it is a site where they have also a section uh, for disability. So you could find some others there. And our in our practice guideline, we have a section about uh, sexual objects. So if you have, for example, an occupational therapist in your caseload and you feel comfortable talking with him or her about it you should you should refer you could refer uh, to the to the I'm sorry you could tell them about the practice guideline which is avail available for free online so they could look up and then talk to you ab uh, about it uh, regarding the and I this is really important because of course uh, sexual objects everywhere even the ones we showed you they are expensive and it is important to take that into account because you cannot buy and then oh, it doesn't work, I will buy another one. Not, not everyone has that many uh, funds, but to this day, to my knowledge, and you'll correct me, I, I don't know, I don't think there is uh, any funding available, not in healthcare, public services, um, at least, because uh, most we, the, there's limited funds, fund only even for like essentials, uh, essential like electrical beds, these are already uh, hard to get sometimes. So for, unfortunately, sexuality is not a priority right now in healthcare for services, but talking about it more and more will lead to that one day, I hope. But do you know, if, if you already know Cynthia, other funding possibilities, I'd like to know too. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, the, the thing is that so what what we what we did to construct the the the, the guideline was really to go to sex sex uh, sex uh, shop. Okay, so all of this is usually available within uh, sex shop. The, the the trick is that uh, it's really related to your physical ability in choosing the good one. So a small handle, a large handle. I will just give a very a clear example of something uh, that Samara has actually experienced. So she, it, it was a woman with a charcot marie tooth disease and she has degree sensation in her genital area. So we needed to find a vibrator that was strong enough, that was like vibrating enough, that was giving enough sensation. Probably, usually your sex shop consultant will not give you that as a first one because it will be too intense for most women. But for her, it was awaking her, her, her sensation enough. So then after that, she could experience a sexual relationship with her uh, boyfriend and they can both have orgasm, but it would be impossible for her boyfriend to give it because her, um, her feeling, her sensation was not awakened and needed to be awakened uh, strongly enough. So that's where it's tricky. So occupational therapists, sexologists are two good resources. What I know from the rest of Canada is that sexologists are not usually part of rehab team. They're more linked to other area of sexology, but in Quebec, 
we do have some sexologists that are linked to rehab center. So that's where sometimes it's the sexologists that could help. And that's the, I mean, that's the most useful resources at all, but they're very limited. And so occupational therapy uh, and in rehab center, they work together, you know, so, but both could give you a uh, very good uh, advice on that. And as we said, also, um, nurses can still, you know, give you some advice. But the thing is that it's not refundable. It's not returnable. You cannot return it. So that's the thing. Um, I'd like to add a, uh, something. Yeah. Just, just so you know, just for information, uh, when creating the guideline, we went, uh, I went into lots of uh, sex shop uh, and I, I, I was curious about how they would react. I was asking about uh, sexual toys for um, and someone with disability, for example, and they were all of them were really, really open and really helped mm, yeah. in finding. So do not hesitate, do not feel embarrassed because they they are this is their job and they are experts in sexual toys and they can help you if you tell them I have this difficulty. I'm sure they can help you. So do not uh, be shy about it. That's, that would be my say uh, my advice. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, one comment. It's not a question. A comment that we're getting is um, that. As a person with a neuromuscular disorder, they are often around a lot of people, so caregivers, family members, and so they don't feel like they have the time alone and away from people with personal care attendants and family members. Any tips on how to sort of ask or assertively ask for that alone time while being mm -hmm. safe in your home? Yeah, that's a that's a big issue that we discuss a lot with healthcare provider. While we did the guide, we, we did validation with occupational therapists, nurses, physio, and there was a lot of issue around uh, you know having intimate time, and that is necessary for for all of us, even if we just want to be alone. You know, sometimes you just don't need to have people. Uh, I think that the most I think that the best way actually is to actually address it. So take your time with your healthcare providers. Uh, maybe show them the guide, show them uh, a presentation. Uh, there's a very good, um, there's a couple of good movie about that or documentary and say, could you, could, could we have a discussion about it? And I know it's probably not easy. I, I'm sure it's not, uh, but I think that and say, I would like to have some time alone. And that could be like, at the beginning, it could be Monday to Tuesday from two to 2.30. So I know it's not fun to do that like that, but don't worry with four kids, we have a, I have a schedule. It's between 9.30 and 10. And that's my only options, you know, b before and after it's not, but I'm joking, but I'm saying that it may be that for to begin with. And then as it come more, um, uh, you know, um, a practice, then it can be more flexible. The other thing is that uh, if you're in a, if you have also, and that's where the uh, occupational therapist can help you, or you can be imaginative. A lot of our uh, patients said that, well, not healthcare providers said the issue was the, uh, actually the, uh, the uh, hygiene before and after that was complex. So if there is personal time that you need to take, but then you can take it in the shower, having a seat, having your masturbate, you know, your, um, your, your sex toys. And then, I mean, you're already there. It's not the ideal, but at least it's where you will be, uh, you know, have personal time. But if you can be set up there and then it's easier for your hygiene and you can do it yourself. So there's a lot of way to think outside of the box, but it's not that easy to think to yourself. I mean, we all have our issue around sexuality, but when it's discussed and when it's in the open, then people start to, um, you know, to try to troubleshoot what could be a problem because it's an activity of daily living. It's in occupational therapy. It's part of activity of daily living, you know. So it's just our mindset that it's supposed to be something personal, taboo, uh, not to talk about that doesn't exist. But I mean, everybody, you know, wants to do it at one part, or most of people want to do it at one part of their life, you know. So I think that that's um, something. And the other thing that we didn't discuss, because that's something we didn't work on, but there's also people that will still start to have a lack of interest in sexuality. And that is as important as having a feeling of wanting sexuality, because that can also become something difficult with the other partner if it's not addressed properly, that there is too much pain, there is too much this or that, or there's just not more, there's no more drive for this activity. And then there is other way to look around with psychologists or social worker or 
um, sexologists to look around how you can touch, you can caress, you can do that. And even with, uh, I was just saying, but maybe off the topic, but one thing that I do to my, the parents of a uh, child that have cognitive and physical disability, I propose to them to install very rapidly, if you have financial means, to go to uh, massotherapy services, so professional massotherapy services. But what it will do, it will permit them to experience touch and being touched in a professional way, but that touching will still have its therapeutic value because those children that becomes adult and that they are never touched except for being washed very rapidly uh, is, I think it's really a need for them. And with uh, professional mesotherapy, if it's installed very early on, well, then it becomes an activity that is like, okay, you go once a month, you go once every two months, but it's still something where you've been touched you're, you feel that human touch that is so uh, so much needed. That's great. I want to be mindful of time, but I'll, I'll take a few more questions that, that came in. Um, I think you did speak about this, uh, recommendations with working with caregivers and their support uh, and their role in supporting persons with neuromuscular disorders with self-pleasure or sexual relations. Mm -hmm. um, the other th a question that uh, has been coming up is around good resources and books. So what I will do is I'll connect with Samar afterwards and, and provide that list to the attendees of today's um, webinar. Uh, some of the toys and adaptive equipment that was mentioned seems to be primarily for female bodies. Mm -hmm. um, any tips or suggestions for males uh, who would like to explore more male sexuality? Of course, sorry, it was just a, probably a tutorial because we're two women, <laughs> just a picture. But Samar is better with with the, <laughs> with that than me. Um, I I there are one one I I. Uh, I'm sorry, I was looking for it and I have made the same conclusions. Yes, there are more uh, sexual objects available for women, but there are for men. The one I, um, I want to show you one that I really like, uh, that I really like, I did not use it, but I mean, I, 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 I like that the idea of it. So I want to share my screen. The one here, for example, that is for men. That is for stimulating a direction, for example, and that was uh, that is one for people with disabilities, and people who don't. So it's uh, for all people. So there are some, but I think uh, you should look. It, it, it depends on what is it that you need. So maybe you look in sexual in um, sex, sex shop or uh, the resources in our guide. But yes, there are not as many and as diverse as for women. But that's something very interesting that could be an area of research, you know, in the, in the future. Uh, I think that that's something that uh, could be uh, added up to our, uh, I think it's a very good comment because our guide is evolving. So I think that that will be very good. I think that's a very good comment and I'll, I'll keep it in mind for sure. We'll try to add some. Maybe it's not our last version of a practice guideline, so maybe second edition will <laughs> be more equal gender. <laughs> Absolutely, and I wonder even, I know the guidelines are for um, occupational therapists, but we're seeing that there is a need for these resources and these guidelines for personal care attendants, personal support workers who mm -hmm. are in the home. Um, another uh, comment that came in or suggestion was, could we do the same session, but for young adults, for, for teenagers on how to ask questions, how to explore mm -hmm. um, their, their sexuality and talk about sexual health. I wanted to thank you both so much for really a candid conversation conversation, an evidence-based conversation, and providing some good tips and resources. I know it's a really large topic, but a great, great first step in being able to, to start the discussion. I do apologize if I missed anyone's question. I'd be happy to note them down, and I'll, I'll uh, share it with our uh, speakers today. I would also like to thank Roche and PTC for helping to support education initiatives like this one and invite you to, to join us tomorrow where we will be talking about caregiving and neuromuscular disorders. Specifically, there will be a roundtable um, of parents with a neuromuscular disorder talking about parenting. There will also be a roundtable of parents without a neuromuscular disorder but who have children with NMDs and also a great session on parental stress and the chronic illness experience. Thank you once again. Thank you for joining and for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Gagnon. Thank you, Samar. Thank you.